when the townsfolk see Venters returning to town with Jane Witherstein's stolen horses, they know somebody's gonna die. Zane Gray, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. We couldn't do this without you. Your monthly donation helps in so many ways, and it also gives you access to more classic titles. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. A $5 monthly donation gets you an $8 monthly coupon code for any audiobook order. Thank you so much. The first season of the Arzen Lupin podcast is complete. Binge all episodes of our Gentleman Burglar's own show and tell your friends. Links can be found in the show notes. The National Audio Theatre Festival has awarded a Platinum Award to my recording of 813 by Maurice LeBlanc. It's the highest honor they bestow, and I'm so happy and humbled to have received it. Thanks to all of our monthly supporters who have made it possible for us to create this award-winning content. And now, Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 9 of 12, by Zane Gray. Chapter 18 Oldring's Nell Some forty hours or more later, Venters created a commotion in Cottonwoods by riding down the main street on Black Star and leading Bells and Knight. He had come upon Bells grazing near the body of a dead rustler, the only incident of his quick ride into the village. Nothing was farther from Venters' mind than bravado. No thought came to him of the defiance and boldness of riding Jane Witherstein's racers straight into the arch-plotter's stronghold. He wanted men to see the famous Arabians. He wanted men to see them dirty and dusty, bearing all the signs of having been driven to their limit. He wanted men to see and to know that the thieves who had ridden them out into the sage had not ridden them back. Venters had come for that and for more. He wanted to meet Tull face to face. If not Tull, then dire. If not dire, than anyone in the secret of these master conspirators. Such was Venter's passion. The meeting with the rustlers, the unprovoked attack upon him, the spilling of blood, the recognition of Jerry Card and the horses, the race, and that last plunge of mad wrangle, all these things, fuel on fuel to the smoldering fire, had kindled and swelled and leaped into living flame. He could have shot Dyer in the midst of his religious services at the altar. He could have killed Tull in front of wives and babes. He walked the three racers down the broad, green-bordered village road. He heard the murmur of running water from Amber Spring. Bitter waters for Jane Witherstein. Men and women stopped to gaze at him and the horses. All knew him. All knew the blacks and the bay. As well as if it had been spoken, Venters read in the faces of men the intelligence that Jane Witherstein's Arabians had been known to have been stolen. Venters reined in and halted before Dyer's residence. It was a long, low stone structure, resembling Witherstein House. The spacious front yard was green and luxuriant, with grass and flowers. Gravel walks led to the huge porch. A well-trimmed hedge of purple sage separated the yard from the church grounds. Birds sang in the trees. Water flowed musically along the walks, and there were glad, careless shouts of children. For Venters, the beauty of this home, and the serenity and its apparent happiness, all turned red and black. For Venters, a shade overspread the lawn, the flowers, 
the old vine-clad stone house, in the music of the singing birds, in the murmur of the running water, he heard an ominous sound. Quiet beauty, sweet music, innocent laughter. By what monstrous abortion of fate did these abide in the shadow of Dyer? Venters rode on and stopped before Tull's cottage. Women stared at him with white faces and then flew from the porch. Tull himself appeared at the door, bent low, craning his neck. His dark face flashed out of sight. The door banged. The heavy bar dropped with a hollow sound. Then Venters shook Blackstar's bridle, and sharply trotting, led the other horses to the center of the village. Here at the intersecting streets and in front of the stores, he halted once more. The usual lounging atmosphere of that prominent corner was not now in evidence. Riders and ranchers and villagers broke up what must have been absorbing conversation. There was a rush of many feet, and then the walk was lined with faces. Venter's glance swept down the line of silent, stone-faced men. He recognized many riders and villagers, but none of those he had hoped to meet. There was no expression in the faces turned toward him. All of them knew him. Most were inimical, but there were few who were not burning with curiosity and wonder in regard to the return of Jane Witherstein's racers. Yet all were silent. Here were the familiar characteristics, masked feeling, strange secretiveness, expressionless expression of mystery and hidden power. Has anybody here seen Jerry Card? queried Venters in a loud voice. In reply there came not a word, not a nod or shake of head, not so much as dropping eye or twitching lip, nothing but a quiet, stony stare. Been under the knife? You've a fine knife wielder here. One tull, I believe. Maybe you've all had your tongues cut out. This passionate sarcasm of Venters brought no response, and the stony calm was as oil on the fire within him. I see some of you pack guns, too, he added in biting scorn. In the long, tense pause, strung keenly as a tight wire, he sat motionless on Black Star. All right, he went on. Then let some of you take this message to Tull. Tell him I've seen Jerry Card. Tell him Jerry Card will never return. Thereupon, in the same dead calm, Venters backed Black Star away from the curb, into the street, and out of range. He was ready now to ride up to Witherstein House and turn the racers over to Jane. Hello, Venters! A familiar voice cried, hoarsely, and he saw a man running toward him. It was the rider Judkins, who came up and gripped Venter's hand. Venters, I could have dropped when I seen them horses. Bet that side ain't a marker to the looks of you. What's wrong? Have you gone crazy? You must be crazy to ride in here this way, with them horses, talk that way about Tull and Jerry Card. Judd, I'm not crazy, only mad clean through replied Venters. Well, now, Burn, I'm glad to hear some of your old self in your voice, for when you come up, you look like the corpse of a dead rider with fire for eyes. You had that crowd too stiff for throwing guns. Come, we've got to have a talk. Let's go up the lane. We ain't much safe here. Judkins mounted bells and rode with Venters up to the Cottonwood Grove. Here they dismounted and went among the trees. Let's hear from you first, said Judkins. You fetched back them horses. That is the trick. And of course you got Jerry the same as you got Horn. Horn? Sure. He was found dead yesterday, all chewed by coyotes. And he'd been shot plumb center. Where was he found? At the split down the trail? You know, where Oldring's cattle trail runs off north from the trail to the pass? That's where I met Jerry and the rustlers. What was Horn doing with them? I thought Horn was an honest cattleman. Lord, Byrne, don't ask me that. I'm all muddled now trying to figure things. Venters told of the fight and the race with Jerry Card and its tragic conclusion. I knowed it. 
and knowed all along that Wrangle was the best horse, exclaimed Judkins, with his lean face working and his eyes lighting. That was a race. Lord, I'd like to have seen Wrangle jump the cliff with Jerry, and that was goodbye to the grandest horse and rider ever on the sage. But, Byrne, after you got the horses, why do you want to bolt right in Toll's face? I want him to know. And if I can get to him, I'll... You can't get near Tull, interrupted Judkins. That vigilante bunch have taken to being bodyguard for Tull and Dyer, too. Hasn't Lassiter made a break yet? inquired Venters curiously. Nah, replied Judkins scornfully. Jane turned his head. He's mad in love over her. Follows her like a dog. He ain't no more Lassiter. He's lost his nerve. He doesn't look like the same fella. It's village talk. Everybody knows it. He hasn't thrown a gun, and he won't. Judd, I'll bet he does, replied Venters earnestly. Remember what I say. This Lassiter is something more than a gunman. Judd, he's big. He's great. I feel that in him. God help Tull and Dyer when Lassiter does go after them. For horses and riders and stone walls won't save them. Well, have it your way, Byrne. I hope you're right. Naturally, I've been some sore on Lassiter for getting soft. But I ain't denying his nerve, or whatever's great in him that sort of paralyzes people. No later than this morning I seen him sauntering down the lane, quiet and slow. And like his guns, he comes black. Black. That's Lassiter. Well, the crowd on the corner never batted an eye. And I'll gamble my horse that there wasn't one who had a heartbeat till Lassiter got by. We went in Snell's saloon, and as there wasn't no gunplay, I had to go in too. And there, darn my pictures, if Lassiter wasn't standing to the bar, drinking and talking with Aldrin. Aldrin? whispered Venters. His voice, as all fire and pulse within him, seemed to freeze. Let go my arm, exclaimed Judkins. That's my bad arm. Sure it was Aldrin. What the hell's wrong with you anyway? Venters, I tell you, something's wrong. You're whiter than a sheet. You can't be scared of the rustler. I don't believe you've got a scare in you. Well, now, just let me talk. You know, I like to talk, and if I'm slow, I always get there sometime. As I said, Lassiter was talky chummy with Aldrin. There was no hard feelings, and the gang wasn't paying no particular attention. But like a cat watching a mouse, I had my eyes on them two fellas. It was strange for me, that confab. I'm getting to think a lot for a fellow who doesn't know much. There's been some queer deals lately, and this seemed to me the queerest. These men stood to the bar alone, and so close their big gun hilts butted together. I seen Aldrin was some surprised at first, and Lassiter was cool as ice. They talked, and presently it's something Lassiter said. The rustler bawled out a curse, and then he just fell up against the bar and sagged there. The gang in the saloon looked around and laughed. That's about all. Finally, Aldrin turned, and it was easy to see something had shook him. Yes, sir, that big rustler. You know, he's as broad as he is long, and the powerfulest build of a man. Yes, sir, the nerve had been taken out of him. Then, after a little, he began to talk and said a lot to Lassiter. And by and by, it didn't take much of an eye to see that Lassiter was getting hit hard. I never seen him any way but cooler and nice, till then. He seemed to be hit harder than Aldrin, only he didn't roar out that way. He just kind of sunk in, and looked, and looked, and he didn't see a living soul in that saloon. Then he sort of come to, and shaken hands, mind you, shaking hands with Aldrin, he went out. I couldn't help thinking how easy even a boy could have dropped the great gunman then. Well, the rustler stood at the bar for a long time, and he was seeing things far off, too. They come to and roared for whiskey, and gulped a drink that was big enough to drown me. Is Aldring here now? whispered Venters. He could not speak above a whisper. Judkins' story had been meaningless to him. He's at Snell's yet. Burn, I haven't told you that 
The rustlers have been raising hell. They shot up Stonebridge and Glaze, and for three days they've been here drinking and gambling and throwing of gold. These rustlers have a pile of gold. If it was gold dust or nugget gold, I'd have reason to think, but it's new gold coin, as if it had just come from the United States Treasury. And the coin's genuine. That's all been proved. The truth is, Holdren's on a rampage. A while back he lost his masked rider, and they say he's wild about that. I'm wondering if Lassiter could have told the rustler anything about that little masked, hard-riding devil. Right? He was most as good as Jerry Card. And Byrne, I've been wondering if you know... Judkins, you're a good fellow, interrupted Venters. Someday I'll tell you a story, but I've no time now. Take the horses to Jane. Judkins stared, and then, muttering to himself, he mounted bells and stared again at Venters. And then, leading the other horses, he rode into the grove and disappeared. Once, long before, on the night Venters had carried Bess through the canyon and up into Surprise Valley, he had experienced the strangeness of faculties singularly, tinglingly acute. And now the same sensation recurred. But it was different in that he felt cold, frozen, mechanical, incapable of free thought, and all about him seemed unreal, aloof, remote. He hid his rifle in the sage, marking its exact location with extreme care. Then he faced down the lane and strode toward the center of the village. Perceptions flashed upon him, the faint, cold touch of the breeze, a cold, silvery tinkle of flowing water, a cold sun shining out of a cold sky, song of birds and laugh of children, coldly distant. Cold and intangible were all things in earth and heaven. Colder and tighter stretched the skin over his face. Colder and harder grew the polished butts of his guns. Colder and steadier became his hands as he wiped the clammy sweat from his face or reached low to his gun sheaths. Men, meeting him in the walk, gave him wide berth. In front of Bevan's store, a crowd melted apart for his passage, and their faces and whispers were faces and whispers of a dream. He turned a corner to meet Tull face to face, eye to eye, as once before he had seen this man pale to a ghastly livid white, so again he saw the change. Tull stopped in his tracks, with right hand raised and shaking. Suddenly it dropped, and he seemed to glide aside, to pass out of Venter's sight. Next he saw many horses with bridles down, all clean-limbed, dark bays or blacks, rustlers' horses. Loud voices and boisterous laughter, rattle of dice and scrape of chair and clink of gold burst in mingled din from an open doorway. He stepped inside. With a sight of smoke-hazed room and drinking, cursing, gambling, dark-visaged men, reality once more dawned upon Venters. His entrance had been unnoticed, and he bent his gaze upon the drinkers at the bar. Dark-clothed, dark-faced men they all were, burned by the sun, bow-legged as were most riders of the sage, but neither lean nor gaunt. Then Venter's gaze passed to the tables, and swiftly it swept over the hard-featured gamesters, to alight upon the huge, shaggy, black head of the rustler chief. Oldring, he cried, and to him his voice seemed to split a bell in his ears. It stilled the din. That silence suddenly broke to the scrape and crash of Oldring's chair as he rose. And then, while he passed, a great gloomy figure, again the thronged room stilled in silence yet deeper. Oldring, a word with you, continued Venters. Oh, what's this? boomed Oldring in frowning scrutiny. Come outside, alone. A word for you, from your masked rider. Oldring kicked a chair out of his way and lunged forward with a stamp of heavy boot that jarred the floor. He waved down his muttering rising men. Venters backed out of the door and waited, hearing 
as no sound had ever before struck into his soul, the rapid, heavy steps of the rustler. Oldring appeared, and Venters had one glimpse of his great breadth and bulk, his gold-buckled belt with hanging guns, his high-top boots with gold spurs. In that moment, Venters had a strange, unintelligible curiosity to see Oldring alive. The rustler's broad brow, his large black eyes, his sweeping beard, as dark as the wing of a raven, his enormous width of shoulder and depth of chest, his whole splendid presence, so wonderfully charged with vitality and force and strength, seemed to afford Venters an unutterable fiendish joy, because for that magnificent manhood and life he meant cold and sudden death. Oldring, Bess is alive, but she's dead to you, dead to the life you made her lead, dead as you will be in one second. Swift as lightning, Venter's glance dropped from Oldring's rolling eyes to his hands. One of them, the right, swept out, then toward his gun, and Venter's shot him through the heart. Slowly, Oldring sank to his knees, and the hand dragging at the gun fell away. Venter's strangely acute faculties grasped the meaning of that limp arm, of the swaying hulk, of the gasp and heave, of the quivering beard. But was that awful spirit in the black eyes only one of vitality? Ma'am, why didn't you wait? Bess was... Oldring's whisper died under his beard, and with a heavy lurch, he fell forward. Bounding swiftly away, Venters fled around the corner, across the street, and leaping a hedge, he ran through yard, orchard, and garden to the sage. Here, under cover of the tall brush, he turned west and ran on to the place where he had hidden his rifle. Securing that, he again set out into a run, and circling through the sage, came up behind Jane Witherstein's stable and corrals, with laboring, dripping chest and pain as of a knife thrust in his side. He stopped to regain his breath, and while resting his eyes, roved around in search of a horse. Doors and windows of the stable were open wide and had a deserted look. One dejected, lonely burrow stood in the near corral. Strange indeed was the silence brooding over the once happy, noisy home of Jane Witherstein's pets. He went into the corral, exercising care to leave no tracks, and led the burrow to the watering trough. Venters, though not thirsty, drank till he could drink no more. Then leading the burrow over hard ground, he struck into the sage and down the slope. He strode swiftly, turning from time to time to scan the slope for riders. His head just topped the level of sagebrush, and the burrow could not have been seen at all. Slowly the green of cottonwoods sank behind the slope, and at last a wavering line of purple sage met the blue of sky. To avoid being seen, to get away, to hide his trail, these were the sole ideas in his mind as he headed for Deception Pass, and he directed all his acuteness of eye and ear and the keenness of a rider's judgment for distance and ground to stern accomplishment of the task. He kept to the sage far to the left of the trail leading into the pass. He walked ten miles and looked back a thousand times. Always the graceful purple wave of sage remained wide and lonely, a clear, undotted, waste. Coming to a stretch of rocky ground, he took advantage of it to cross the trail and then continued down on the right. At length, he persuaded himself that he would be able to see riders mounted on horses before they could see him on the little burrow, and he rode bareback. Hour by hour, the tireless burrow kept to his faithful steady trot. The sun sank, and the long shadows lengthened down the slope. Moving veils of purple twilight crept out of the hollows, and mustering and forming on the levels soon merged and shaded into night. Venters guided the burrow nearer to the trail, so that he could see its white line from the ridges, and ride on through the hours. Once down in the pass without leaving a trail, he would hold himself safe for the time being. 
When late in the night, he reached the break in the sage, he sent the burrow down ahead of him and started an avalanche that all but buried the animal at the bottom of the trail. Bruised and battered as he was, he had a moment's elation, for he had hidden his tracks. Once more he mounted the burrow and rode on. The hour was the blackest of the night when he made the thicket which enclosed his old camp. Here he turned the burrow loose in the grass near the spring and then lay down on his old bed of leaves. He felt only vaguely as outside things, the ache and burn and throb of the muscles of his body. But the damned up torrent of emotion at last burst its bounds, and the hour that saw his release from immediate action was one that confounded him in the reaction of his spirit. He suffered without understanding why. He caught glimpses into himself, into unlit darkness of soul. The fire that had blistered him and the cold which had frozen him now united into one torturing possession of his mind and heart, and like a fiery steed with ice-shod feet, ranged his being, ran rioting through his blood, trampling the resurging good, dragging ever at the evil. Out of the subsiding chaos came a clear question. What had happened? He had left the valley to go to Cottonwoods. Why? It seemed that he had gone to kill a man, Oldring. The name riveted his consciousness upon the one man of all men upon earth whom he had wanted to meet. He had met the rustler. Venters recalled the smoky haze of the saloon, the dark-visaged men, the huge Oldring. He saw him step out of the door, a splendid specimen of manhood, a handsome giant with purple-black and sweeping beard. He remembered inquisitive gaze of falcon eyes. He heard himself repeating, Oldring, Bess is alive, but she's dead to you. And he felt himself jerk, and his ears throbbed to the thunder of a gun, and he saw the giant sink slowly to his knees. Was that only the vitality of him? That awful light in the eyes? Only the hard-dying life of a tremendously powerful brute? A broken whisper, strange as death. Man, why didn't you wait? Bess was... An old ring plunged face forward, dead. I killed him, cried Venters, in remembering shock. But it wasn't that. How oh, the look in his eyes, and his whisper... Herein lay the secret that had clamored to him through all the tumult and stress of his emotions. What a look in the eyes of a man shot through the heart. It had been neither hate nor ferocity, nor fear of men, nor fear of death. It had been no passionate, glinting spirit of a fearless foe, willing shot for shot, life for life, but lacking physical power. Distinctly recalled now, never to be forgotten, Venters saw in Old Ring's magnificent eyes the rolling of great, glad, surprise, softness, love. Then came a shadow and the terrible superhuman striving of his spirit to speak. Old Ring shot through the heart, had fought and forced back death, not for a moment in which to shoot or curse, but to whisper strange words. What words for a dying man to whisper? Why had not Venters waited? For what? There was no plea for life. It was regret that there was not a moment of life left in which to speak. Bess was. Herein lay renewed torture for Venters. What had Bess been to Aldring? The old question, like a specter, stalked from its grave to haunt him. He had overlooked... He had forgiven, he had loved, and he had forgotten. And now, out of the mystery of a dying man's whisper, rose again that perverse, unsatisfied, jealous uncertainty. Bess had loved that splendid black-crowned giant. By her own confession she had loved him. An inventor's soul again flamed up the jealous hell. Then, into the clamoring hell, burst the shot that had killed Oldring, and it rang in a wild fiendish gladness, 
a hateful, vengeful joy. That passed to the memory of the love and light in Aldring's eyes and the mystery in his whisper. So the changing, swaying emotions fluctuated in Venter's heart. This was the climax of his year of suffering and the crucial struggle of his life. And when the gray dawn came, he rose, a gloomy, almost heartbroken man, but victor over evil passions. He could not change the past, and even if he had not loved Bess with all his soul, he had grown into a man who would not change the future he had planned for her. Only, and once for all, he must know the truth, know the worst, stifle all these insistent doubts and subtle hopes and jealous fancies, and kill the past by knowing truly what Bess had been to Aldring. For that matter, he knew. He had always known. But he must hear it spoken. Then, when they had safely gotten out of that wild country to take up a new and an absorbing life, she would forget. She would be happy. And through that, in the years to come, he could not but find life worth living. All day, he rode slowly and cautiously up to the pass, taking time to peer around corners, to pick out hard ground and grassy patches, and to make sure there was no one in pursuit. In the night sometime, he came to the smooth, scrawled rocks dividing the valley, and here set the burrow at liberty. He walked beyond, climbed the slope in the dim, starlit gorge, then, weary to the point of exhaustion, he crept into a shallow cave and fell asleep. In the morning, when he descended the trail, he found the sun was pouring a golden stream of light through the arch of the great stone bridge. Surprise Valley, like a valley of dreams, sat mystically soft and beautiful, awakening to the golden flood, which was rolling away its slumberous bands of mist brightening its walled faces. While yet far off, he discerned Bess moving under the silver spruces, and soon the barking of the dogs told him that they had seen him. He heard the mockingbirds singing in the trees, and then the twittering of the quail. Ring and Whitey came bounding toward him, and behind them ran Bess, her hands outstretched. Burn! You're back! You're back! She cried in joy that rang of her loneliness. Yes, I'm back, he said, as she rushed to meet him. She had reached out for him when suddenly, as she saw him closely, something checked her, and as quickly all her joy fled, and with it her color, leaving her pale and trembling. Oh, what's happened? A good deal has happened, Bess. I don't need to tell you what, and I'm played out, worn out in mind more than body. Dear, you look strange to me faltered Bess. Never mind that. I'm all right. There's nothing for you to be scared about. Things are going to turn out just as we have planned. As soon as I'm rested, we'll make a break to get out of the country. Only now, right now, I must know the truth about you. Truth about me? echoed Bess, shrinkingly. She seemed to be casting back into her mind for a forgotten key. Venters himself, as he saw her, received a pang. Yes, the truth. Best don't misunderstand. I haven't changed that way. I love you still. I love you more afterward. Life will be just as sweet, sweeter to us. We'll be, be married as soon as ever we can. We'll be happy. But there's a devil in me. A perverse, jealous devil and I have queer fancies. I forgot for a long time. Now all those fiendish little whispers of doubt and faith and fear and hope come torturing me again. I've got to kill them with the truth. I'll tell you anything you want to know, she replied frankly. And by heaven, we'll have it over and done with. Bess, did Oldring love you? Certainly he did. Did, did you love him? Of course, I told you so. How can you tell it so lightly? Cried Venters passionately. 
Haven't you any sense of... of... He choked back speech. He felt the rush of pain and passion. He seized her in rude, strong hands and drew her close. He looked straight into her dark blue eyes. They were shadowing with the old wistful light, but they were as clear as the limpid water of the spring. They were earnest, solemn, in unutterable love and faith and abnegation. Venters shivered. He knew he was looking into her soul. He knew she could not lie in that moment, but that she might tell the truth. Looking at him with those eyes almost killed his belief in purity. What are, what were you to, to Aldring? He panted fiercely. I am his daughter, she replied instantly. Venters slowly let go of her. There was a violent break in the force of his feeling, then creeping blankness. What was it you said? He asked in a kind of dull wonder. I am his daughter. Oldring's daughter? Queried Venters, with life gathering in his voice. Yes. With a passionately awakening start, he grasped her hands and drew her close. All the time. You've been Oldring's daughter? Yes, of course, all the time. Always. But Bess, you told me. You let me think. I made out you were so, so ashamed. It is my shame, she said, with voice deep and full, and now the scarlet fired her cheek. I told you I'm nothing, nameless, just Bess, Aldring's girl. I know, I remember, but I never thought, he went on hurriedly, huskily. That time, when you lay dying, you prayed, you... Somehow, I got the idea you were bad. Bad? she asked with a little laugh. She looked up with a faint smile of bewilderment and the absolute unconsciousness of a child. Venters gasped at the gathering might of the truth. She did not understand his meaning. Bess, Bess! He clasped her in his arms, hiding her eyes against his breast. She must not see his face in that moment. And he held her while he looked out across the valley. In his dim and blinded sight, in the blur of golden light and moving mist, he saw Oldring. She was the rustler's nameless daughter. Oldring had loved her. He had so guarded her, so kept her from women and men and knowledge of life, that her mind was as a child's. That was part of the secret, part of the mystery. That was the wonderful truth. Not only was she not bad, but good, pure, innocent above all innocence in the world, the innocence of lonely girlhood. He saw Aldring's magnificent eyes, inquisitive, searching, softening. He saw them flare in amaze, in gladness, with love, then suddenly strain in terrible effort of will. He heard Aldring whisper and saw him sway like a log and fall. Then a million bellowing, thundering voices, gunshots of conscience, thunderbolts of remorse, dinned horribly in his ears. He had killed Bess's father. Then a rushing wind filled his ears like a moan of wind in the cliffs, a knell indeed, Aldring's knell. He dropped to his knees and hid his face against Bess and grasped her with the hands of a drowning man, my God, my God, oh, Bess, forgive me. Never mind what I've done, what I've thought, but forgive me. I'll give you my life. I'll live for you. I'll love you. Oh, I do love you as no man ever loved a woman. I want you to know, to remember that I fought a fight for you. However blind I was, I thought, I thought, never mind what I thought, but I loved you. I asked you to marry me. Let that, let me have that, to hug to my heart. Oh, Bess, I was driven, and I might have known. I could not rest nor sleep till I had this mystery solved. God, how things work out. Burn, you're weak.
trembling. You talk wildly, cried Bess. You've overdone your strength. There's nothing to forgive. There's no mystery except your love for me. You have come back to me. And she clasped his head tenderly in her arms and pressed it closely to her throbbing breast. Chapter 19 Fay. At the home of Jane Witherstein, little Fay was climbing onto Lassiter's knee. Does you love me? she asked. Lassiter, who was as serious with Fay as he was gentle and loving, assured her in earnest and elaborate speech that he was her devoted subject. Fay looked thoughtful and appeared to be debating the duplicity of men or searching for a supreme test to prove this cavalier. Do you love my new mother? she asked, with bewildering suddenness. Jane Witherstein laughed, and for the first time in many a day she felt a stir of her pulse and warmth in her cheek. It was a still, drowsy summer of afternoon, and the three were sitting in the shade of the wooded knoll that faced the sage slope. Little Fay's brief spell of unhappy longing for her mother, the childish, mystic gloom, had passed. And now, where Fay was, there were prattle and laughter and glee. She had emerged from sorrow to be the incarnation of joy and loveliness. She had grown supernaturally sweet and beautiful. For Jane Witherstein, the child was an answer to prayer, a blessing, a possession infinitely more precious than all she had lost. For Lassiter, Jane divined that little Fay had become a religion. Does you love my new mother? repeated Fay. Lassiter's answer to this was a modest and sincere affirmative. Why don't you marry my new mother and be my father? Of the thousands of questions put by little Fay to Lassiter, this was the first he had been unable to answer. Fay, Fay, don't ask questions like that, said Jane. Why? Because, replied Jane, and she found it strangely embarrassing to meet the child's gaze. It seemed to her that Fay's violet eyes looked through her with piercing wisdom. You love him, don't you? Dear child, run and play, said Jane. But don't go too far. Don't go from this little hill. Fay pranced off wildly, joyous over freedom that had not been granted her for weeks. Jane, why are children more sincere than grown-up persons? asked Lassiter. Are they? I reckon so. Little Fay there, she sees things as they appear on the face. An Indian does that. So does a dog. And an Indian and a dog are most of the time right in what they see. Maybe a child is always right. Well, what does Fay see? asked Jane. I reckon you know. I wonder what goes on in Fay's mind when she sees part of the truth with the wise eyes of a child and want to know more meets with Strange falseness from you. Wait, you are false in a way, though you're the best woman I ever knew. What I want to say is this. Fay has taken your pretending to... to care for me for the thing it looks on the face. And her little foreman mind asks questions. And the answers she gets are different from the looks of things. So she'll grow up gradually taking on that falseness and be like the rest of the women, and men too. And the truth of this falseness to life is proved by your appearing to love me when you don't. Things aren't always what they seem. Lassiter, you're right. A child should be told the absolute truth, but is that possible? I haven't been able to do it, and all my life I've loved the truth, and I've prided myself upon being truthful. Maybe that was only egotism. I'm learning much, my friend. Some of those blinding scales have fallen from my eyes, and, and as to caring for you, I think I care a great deal. How much, how little, I couldn't say. My heart is almost broken, Lassiter, so now is not a good time to judge of affection. I can still play and be merry with Fay. I can still dream. But when I attempt 
serious thought, I'm dazed. I don't think. I don't care anymore. I don't pray. Think of that, my friend. But in spite of my numb feeling, I believe I'll rise out of all this dark agony a better woman, with greater love of man and God. I'm on the rack now. I'm senseless to all but pain and growing dead to that. Sooner or later, I shall rise out of this stupor. I'm waiting the hour. It'll soon come, Jane, replied Lassiter soberly. Then I'm afraid for you. Years are terrible things, and for years you've been bound. Habit of years is strong as life itself. Somehow, though, I believe as you that you'll come out of it all a finer woman. I'm waiting, too, and I'm wondering. I reckon, Jane, that marriage between us is out of all human reason. Lassiter, my dear friend, it's impossible for us to marry. Why, as Faye says, inquired Lassiter, with gentle persistence. Why? I never thought why, but it's not possible. I am Jane, daughter of Witherstein. My father would rise out of his grave. I'm of Mormon birth. I'm being broken, but I'm still a Mormon woman, and you... You are Lassiter. Maybe I'm not so much Lassiter as I used to be. What was it you said? Habit of years is strong as life itself? You can't change the one habit, the purpose of your life. For you still pack those black guns. You still nurse your passion for blood. A smile, like a shadow, flickered across his face. No. Lassiter, I lied to you, but I beg of you, don't you lie to me. I have great respect for you. I believe you're softened toward most, perhaps all, my people, except. But when I speak of your purpose, your hate, your guns, I have only him in mind. I don't believe you've changed. For answer, he unbuckled the heavy cartridge belt and laid it with the heavy swing gun sheaths in her lap. Lassiter, Jane whispered, as she gazed from him to the black, cold guns. Without them, he appeared shorn of strength, defenseless, a smaller man. Was she Delilah? Swiftly, conscious of only one motive, refusal to see this man called craven by his enemies, she rose, and with blundering fingers buckled the belt round his waist where it belonged. Lassiter, I am the coward. Come with me out of Utah where I can put away my guns and be a man, he said. I reckon I'll prove it to you then. Come. You got Black Star back and Knight and Bells. Let's take the racers and Little Fay and race out of Utah. The horses and the child are all you have left. Come. No. No, Lassiter. I'll never leave Utah. What would I do in the world with my broken fortunes and my broken heart? I'll never leave these purple slopes I love so well. I reckon I ought to have known that. Presently you'll be living down here in a hovel, and presently Jane Witherstein will be a memory. I only wanted to have a chance to show you how a man, any man, can be better than he was. If we left Utah, I could prove. I reckon I could prove this thing you call love. It's strange. And hell and heaven at once, Jane Witherstein. Appears to me that you've thrown away your big heart on love. Love of religion and duty and churchmen and riders and poor families and poor children. Yet you can't see what love is, how it changes a person. Listen, and in telling you Millie Earn's story, I'll show you how love changed her. Millie and me was children when our family moved from Missouri to Texas, and we growed up in Texas ways, same as if we'd been born there. We had been poor, and there we prospered. In town, the little village where we went became a town, and strangers and new families kept moving in. Millie was the belle them days. I can see her now, a little girl no bigger than a bird, and as pretty. 
She had the finest eyes, dark blue-black when she was excited, and beautiful all the time. You remember Millie's eyes? And she had light brown hair with streaks of gold, and a mouth that every fellow wanted to kiss. And about the time Millie was the prettiest and the sweetest, along came a young minister who began to ride some of a race with the other fellows for Millie, and he won. Millie had always been strong on religion, and when she met Frank Earn, she went in heart and soul for the salvation of souls. Fact was, Millie, through study of the Bible and attending church and revivals, went a little out of her head. They didn't worry the old folks none, and the only worry to me was Millie's everlasting praying and working to save my soul. She never converted me, but we were the best of comrades, and I reckon no brother and sister ever loved each other better. Well, Frank Earn and me hit up a great friendship. He was a strapping fellow, good to look at, and had the most pleasing ways. His religion never bothered me, for he could hunt and fish and ride and be a good fellow. After Buffalo once, he come pretty near to saving my life. We got to be thick as brothers, and he was the only man I ever seen who I thought was good enough for Millie. And the day they were married, I got drunk for the only time in my life. Soon after that, I left home. It seems Millie was the only one who could keep me home, and I went to the bad. As to prosper, and I saw some pretty hard life in the panhandle. And then I went north. In them days, Kansas and Nebraska was as bad, come to think of it, as these days, right here on the border of Utah. I got to be pretty handy with guns, and there wasn't many riders as could beat me riding. And I can say all modest-like that I never seen the white man who could track a horse or a steer or a man with me. For I noted, two years slipped by. And all at once I got homesick and pulled a bridle south. Things at home had changed. I never got over that homecoming. Mother was dead and in her grave. Father was a silent, broken man, killed already on his feet. Frank Hearn was a ghost of his old self, through with working, through with preaching, almost through with living. And Millie was gone. It was a long time before I got the story. Father had no mind left, and Frank Hearn was afraid to talk. So I had to pick up what had happened from different people. It appears that soon after I left home, another preacher came to the little town, and he and Frank became rivals. This fellow was different from Frank. He preached some other kind of religion, and he was quick and passionate where Frank was slow and mild. He went after people, women especially. In looks he couldn't compare to Frank Earn, but he had power over women. He had a voice, and he talked and talked and preached and preached. Millie fell under his influence. She became mildly interested in his religion. Frank had patience with her, as was his way, and let her be as interested as she liked. All religions were devoted to one God, he said, and it wouldn't hurt Millie none to study a different point of view. So the new preacher often called on Millie, and sometimes in Frank's absence. Frank was a cattleman between Sundays. Along about this time, an incident come off that I couldn't get much light on. A stranger come to town and was seen with the preacher. This stranger was a big man with an eye like blue ice and a beard of gold. He had money, and appeared a man of mystery, and the town went to buzzin' when he disappeared about the same time as a young woman known to be mightily interested in the new preacher's religion. Then presently, along comes a man from somewhere in Illinois, and he up and spots this preacher as a famous Mormon proselyter. That riled Frank Earn as nothing ever before, and from rivals they come to be bitter enemies and it ended in Frank going to the meeting house where Millie was listening, and before her and everybody else, he called that preacher, called him, well, almost as hard as Venters called Tull here some time back. And Frank followed up that call with a horse whipping, and he drove the proselyter out of town. People noticed, so it was said, 
that Millie's sweet disposition changed. Some said it was because she would soon become a mother, and others said she was pining after the new religion. And there was a woman who said right out that she was pining after the Mormon. Anyway, one morning Frank rode in from one of his trips to find Millie gone. He had no real near neighbors, living a little out of town, but those who was nearest said a wagon had gone by in the night, and they thought it stopped at her door. Well, tracks always tell, and there was the wagon tracks and horse tracks and man tracks. The news spread like wildfire that Millie had run off from her husband. Everybody but Frank believed it and wasn't slow in telling why she run off. Mother had always hated that strange streak of Millie's, taken up with a new religion as she had, and she believed Millie ran off with the Mormon. That hastened Mother's death. She died unforgiven. Father wasn't the kind to bow down under disgrace or misfortune, but he had surpassing love for Millie, and the loss of her broke him. From the minute I heard of Millie's disappearance, I never believed she went off of her own free will. I knew Millie, and I knew she couldn't have done that. I stayed at home a while, trying to make Frank Earn talk, but if he knowed anything, then he wouldn't tell it. So I set out to find Millie, and I tried to get on the trail of that proselyter. I knew if I ever struck a town he'd visited that I'd get a trail. I knew, too, that nothing short of hell would stop his proselyting. And I rode from town to town. I had a blind faith that something was guiding me. And as the weeks and months went by, I growed into a strange sort of man, I guess. Anyway, people were afraid of me. Two years after that, way over in the corner of Texas, I struck a town where my man had been. He'd just left. People said he came to that town without a woman. I back-trailed my man through Arkansas and Mississippi, and the old trail got hot again in Texas. I found the trail where he first went after leaving home, and here I got track of Millie. I found a cabin where she had given birth to her baby. There was no way to tell whether she'd been kept a prisoner or not. The fellow who owned the place was a mean, silent sort of a skunk, and as I was leaving, I just took a chance and left my mark on him. Then I went home again. It was to find I hadn't any home. No more. Father had been dead a year. Frank Earn still lived in the house where Millie had left him. I stayed with him a while, and I grew old watching him. His farm had gone to weed. His cattle had strayed or been rustled. His house weathered till it wouldn't keep out rain nor wind. And Frank sat on the porch and whittled sticks, and day by day wasted away. There was times when he ranted about like a crazy man, but mostly he was always sitting and staring with eyes that made a man curse. I figured Frank had a secret fear that I needed to know, and when I told him I'd trailed Millie for near three years and had got trace of her and saw where she'd had her baby, I thought he would drop dead at my feet. And when he'd come around more natural-like, he begged me to give up the trail but he wouldn't explain. So I let him alone and watched him day and night. And I found there was one thing still precious to him, and it was a little drawer where he kept his papers. This was in the room where he slept, and it appeared he seldom slept. But after being patient, I got the contents of that drawer and found two letters from Millie. One was a long letter, written a few months after her disappearance. She had been bound and gagged and dragged away from her home by three men, and she named them Herd, Metzger, Slack. They were strangers to her. She was taken to the little town where I found trace of her two years after. But she didn't send the letter from that town. There she was penned in. It appeared that the proselytes, who had, of course, come on the scene, was not running any risk of losing her. She went on to say that for a time she was out of her head, and when she got right again, all that kept her alive was the baby. It was a beautiful baby, she said, and all she thought and dreamed of was somehow to get baby back to its father. 
and then she thankfully lay down and died. And the letter ended abrupt, in the middle of a sentence, and it wasn't signed. The second letter was written more than two years after the first. It was from Salt Lake City. It simply said that Millie had heard her brother was on her trail. She asked Frank to tell her brother to give up the search, because if he didn't, she would suffer in a way too horrible to tell. She didn't beg, she just stated the fact and made the simple request. And she ended that letter by saying she would soon leave Salt Lake City with the man she had come to love, who would never be heard of again. I recognized Millie's handwriting, and I recognized her way of putting things. But that second letter told me of some great change in her. Pondering over it, I felt at last she'd either come to love that feller and his religion, or some terrible fear made her lie and say so. I couldn't be sure which. But of course I meant to find out. I'll say here, if I'd known Mormons then as I do now, I'd left Millie to her fate. Or maybe she was right about what she'd suffer if I kept on her trail. But I was young and wild them days. First I went to the town where she'd first been taken, and I went to the place where she'd been kept. I got that skunk who owned the place, and took him out in the woods, and made him tell all he knowed. That wasn't much as to length, but it was pure hell's fire in substance. This time I left him some incapacitated for any more skunk work short of hell. Then I hit the trail for Utah. That was fourteen years ago. I saw the incoming of most of the Mormons. It was a wild country and a wild time. I rode from town to town, village to village, ranch to ranch, camp to camp. I never stayed long in one place. I never had but one idea. I never rested. Four years went by, and I knowed every trail in northern Utah. I kept on, and as time went by, and I'd begun to grow old in my search, I had firmer blinder faith in whatever was guiding me. Once I read about a feller who sailed the seven seas and traveled the world, and he had a story to tell, and whenever he seen the man to whom he must tell that story, he knowed him on sight. I was like that. Only I had a question to ask. And always I knew the man of whom I must ask. So I never really lost the trail though for many years it was the dimmest trail ever followed by any man. Then come a change in my luck. Along in central Utah, I rounded up Heard, and I whispered something in his ear and watched his face, and then throwed a gun against his bowels, and he died with his teeth so tight shut I couldn't have pried them open with a knife. Slack and Metzger that same year both heard me whisper the same question and neither would they speak a word when they lay dying. Long before I'd learned no man of this breed or class, or God knows what, would give up any secrets. I had to see in a man's fear of death the connections with Millie Earn's fate, and as the years passed at long intervals, I would find such a man. So as I drifted on the long trail down into southern Utah, my name preceded me, and I had to meet a people prepared for me and ready with guns. They made me a gunman, and that suited me. In all this time, signs of the proselyter and the giant with the blue ice eyes and the gold beard seemed to fade dimmer out of the trail. Only twice in ten years did I find a trace of that mysterious man who had visited the proselyter at my home village. What he had to do with Millie's fate was beyond all hope for me to learn unless my guiding spirit led me to him. As for the other man, I knew, as sure as I breathed and the stars shone and the wind blew, that I'd meet him some day. Eighteen years I've been on the trail, and it led me to the last lonely villages of the Utah border. Eighteen years. I feel pretty old now. I was only twenty when I hit that trail. Well, as I told you, Back here a ways, a Gentile said Jane Witherstein could tell me about Millie Earn and show me her grave. The low voice ceased, and Lassiter slowly turned his sombrero round and round, 
and appeared to be counting the silver ornaments on the band. Jane, leaning toward him, sat as if petrified, listening intently, waiting to hear more. She could have shrieked, but power of tongue and lips were denied her. She saw only this sad, gray, passion-worn man, and she heard only the faint rustling of the leaves. Well, I came to Cottonwoods, went on Lassiter, and you showed me Millie's grave. And though your teeth have been shut tighter than them of all the dead men lying back along that trail, just the same, you told me the secret I've lived these eighteen years to hear. Jane, I said you'd tell me without ever me asking. I didn't need to ask my question here. The day you remember, when that fat party throwed a gun on me in your court, and— Oh, hush, whispered Jane, blindly holding up her hands. I seen in your face that Dyer, now a bishop, was the proselyter who ruined Millie Earn. For an instant, Jane Witherstein's brain was a whirling chaos, and she recovered to find herself grasping at Lassiter like one drowning. And as if by a lightning stroke, she sprang from her dull apathy into exquisite torture. It's a lie, Lassiter, no, no, she moaned, I swear. You're wrong. Stop. You'd perjure yourself. But I'll spare you that. You poor woman. Still blind. Still faithful. Listen. I know. Let that settle it. And I give up my purpose. What is it you say? I give up my purpose. I've come to see and feel differently. I can't help poor Millie and I've outgrowed revenge. I've come to see I can be no judge for man. I can't kill a man just for hate. Hate ain't the same with me, since I loved you and little Fay. Lassiter, you mean you won't kill him? Jane whispered. No. For my sake? I reckon. I can't understand, but I'll respect your feelings. Because you... Because you love me? Eighteen years, you were that terrible Lassiter, and now? Because you love me? That's it, Jane. Oh, you'll make me love you. How can I help but love you? My heart must be stone. But, oh, Lassiter, wait, wait. Give me time. I'm not what I was. Once it was so easy to love, now it's easy to hate. Wait. My faith in God, some God, still lives. By it I see happier times for you, poor passion-swayed wanderer. For me, a miserable broken woman, I loved your sister Millie. I will love you. I can't have fallen so low. I can't be so abandoned by God that I've no love left to give you. Wait. Let us forget Millie's sad life. I knew it as no one else on earth. There's one thing I shall tell you, if you are at my deathbed. But I can't speak now. I reckon I don't want to hear no more, said Lassiter. Jane leaned against him, as if some pent-up force had rent its way out. She fell into a paroxysm of weeping. Lassiter held her in silent sympathy. By degrees she regained composure, and she was rising, sensible of being relieved of a weighty burden, when a sudden start on Lassiter's part alarmed her. I heard horses, horses with muffled hoofs, he said, and he got up guardedly. Where's Fay? asked Jane, hurriedly glancing round the shady knoll. The bright-haired child, who had appeared to be close all the time, was not in sight. Fay? called Jane. No answering shout of glee. No patter of flying feet. Jane saw Lassiter stiffen. Fay, Oh, Fay! Jane almost screamed. The leaves quivered and rustled. A lonesome cricket chirped in the grass. A bee hummed by. The silence of the waning afternoon breathed hateful portent. It terrified Jane. 
When had silence been so infernal? She's only straight out of earshot, faltered Jane, looking at Lassiter. Pale, rigid as a statue, the rider stood, not in listening, searching posture, but in one of doomed certainty. Suddenly he grasped Jane with an iron hand, and turning his face from her gaze, he strode with her from the knoll. See, Fay played here last, a house of stones and sticks, and here's a corral of pebbles with leaves for horses, said Lassiter, stridently, and pointed to the ground. Back and forth she trailed here. See, she's buried something, a dead grasshopper, and there's a tombstone. Here she went, chasing a lizard. See the tiny streaked trail? She pulled bark off this cottonwood. Look at the dust of the path. The letters you taught her. She's drawn pictures of birds and horses and people. Look across. Oh, Jane, your cross. Lassiter dragged Jane on, and as if from a book, read the meaning of Little Fay's trail. All the way down the knoll, through the shrubbery, round and round a cottonwood, Fay's vagrant fancy left records of her sweet musings and innocent play. Long had she lingered round a bird nest to leave therein the gaudy wing of a butterfly. Long had she played beside the running stream, sending adrift vessels freighted with pebbly cargo. Then she had wandered through the deep grass, her tiny feet scarcely turning a fragile blade, and she had dreamed beside some old faded flowers. Thus her steps led her into the broad lane. The little dimpled imprints of her bare feet showed clean cut in the dust. They went a little way down the lane, and then, at a point where they stopped, the great tracks of a man led out from the shrubbery and returned. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 9 of 12, by Zane Gray. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. It's a great way to build out your library of classic literature. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>